earthquakes, droughts, floods, volcanic eruptions, pandemics. Asia and the Pacific is the world's most disaster-prone region, with 75% of those affected by natural disasters worldwide living in the region. A year into the COVID-19 pandemic, Asia's economy has contracted by 0.2%, the first recession in the region in almost 60 years. In a moment, these extreme phenomena can undo the progress built over many years. Countries and communities can better protect themselves, and any progress they have made, if they can respond with the right interventions while a disaster is unfolding. Now casting is one way to do this. Now casting is a technique for short-range forecasting. Essentially, now and forecasting combined. Now casting in economics is the prediction of the present, the very near future, and the very recent past state of an economic indicator. How is now casting done? Predicting economic conditions takes time because its metrics, such as gross domestic product or GDP, have data that come so infrequently. With now casting, proxy indicators with more frequently available data are used to assess conditions in real time. So instead of waiting for quarterly GDP data, researchers use consumer and business surveys, cement usage, flow of ships, visit to malls, and more to build the picture of the economy. Knowing the real time state of the economy will allow policymakers to assess the socioeconomic impacts of disasters, economic crises, and other extreme events. The Japan Fund for Prosperous and Resilient Asia and the Pacific is funding a technical assistance that aims to help member countries use now casting frameworks in times of disasters. Specifically, the TA aims to use now casting for disaster impact assessments and socioeconomic monitoring. By project completion in 2023, developing members will have a select, consolidated, state of the art, timely, and accessible data sources and now casting technologies for impact assessments. A toolkit of data and methods for customized application in developing member countries. Retrospective impact assessments and case studies of previous disasters. This should help them formulate better policies and responses in times of disasters or pandemics. Good day and welcome to the Asian Impact Webinar on making big data work for economic assessment. My name is Madhavi and I will be the moderator for today's panel discussion. As we just saw in the video that was played, big data and new sources of data offer unprecedented advantages for monitoring economic trends on an ongoing basis and in near real time. High frequency data is also great for making quick impact assessments of major events, such as natural disasters, and more recently, the pandemic, where traditional sources of data come in more slowly. Plus, new analytic approaches help make the most of innovative data. But with the promise come many challenges of big data and its related infrastructure. So how can Asian economies make sense of this data deluge and benefit from their potential so that it can have a transformative impact on our developing economies? Today, we have a very exciting group of panelists to discuss this very issue. Please join me in welcoming Ilan Noy, the Chair in the Economics of Disasters and Climate Change at Victoria University of Wellington, Sonia Akhtar, Assistant Professor at Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore. Narayan Ubechel, Chief Executive Officer of Place Intelligence, an Australia-based data analytics firm. And Eleni Kalamara, a former research associate at the Qatar Center for Global Banking and Finance at King's Business School. Let me remind the audience that you can post your questions for the panelists in the Q&A box and also press the like button to vote for questions that others have posted. And I will raise as many as possible to the panelists. First, let's start uh, with Narayan. Narayan, your firm works with emerging technologies, big data and urban strategy. 
Can you talk a bit about what these new data streams and data analytic tools bring to the table? I am particularly interested in drawing on your experience working with mobility data and in what contexts it could be applied in developing countries. Over to you, Narayan. Thanks, Madhavi, and thanks everyone for your time today. It's a pleasure to be here from Melbourne um, and uh, for the opportunity to talk a little bit about the use of big data, especially human movement data at a nation scale and how we can use that to track change over time and build proxy indicators to understand the impact of major events like floods and earthquakes. And so, of course, there is this rise of big data that has um, sort of taken the world by storm and given us the opportunity to find new ways to look at um, patterns of movement and mobility, place use um, at nation scale. And of course, a challenge in that is to be able to create reliable statistical models that scale that we can have deep confidence in. And so a lot of our work has been focusing on how can we unlock nation scale data sets and use machine learning and advanced data science processes to create some standardization in these very large data sets uh, that we can then use to assess events um, such as monsoonal flooding or, or earthquake or very acute uh, disasters. Um, we've got a couple of slides that I might quickly share um, just to give the audience um, a bit of context. Is that all right, Madhavi? Uh, sure, go ahead. Great, thanks everybody. So I'll just quickly share an example of what, what it is that we're talking about. Um, so of course, there's a lot of stats and um, one stat is that you know cities are generating terabytes of data, uh, but often in rural uh, locations, we don't have that same luxury of really, really rich and dense uh, data sets to work with. Um, and of course, whilst there is a lot of data in, um, in Southeast Asian cities, many of the most affected areas are those that are in, in rural, rural areas. So how do we access the right kinds of big data and use that in a way that we can really unlock deep insights to drive economic recovery and paint more comprehensive pictures of, of, of different places at different scales? So we, our, our work in collaborating with the ADB was to look at some very large areas in Bangladesh, for example, which has many, many river systems. And of course, then how can we bring in some of these nation scale data models to map patterns of activity and, and the distribution of people in and around major events. And so with human mobility data, we can start building these dynamic longitudinal models of how different areas uh, represent in terms of total population, dynamics of movement um, over time and identify at-risk areas. And then measure, of course, using some control data what is happening at these acute moments. And, and here's just a quick example where you see this sharp downturn is of course the monsoonal flooding period and then the recovery bounce back. And so with these large data sets, it becomes possible to start building out indices and building out um, a whole raft of metrics that we can use to track change um, over time. Thanks, Ilan. Indeed, it is um, very exciting that we can use the dynamics of movement to extract so many insights about both the disaster impact and the recovery profile. Uh, let me bring in Ilan to talk a little bit more about um, disaster impact analyses. So Ilan, uh, remote data on night lights, daytime images, uh, automatic identification of ships, um, these are all being used extensively in economic analysis. In general, remote sensing of changes in human activity seems particularly relevant for addressing many challenges in developing Asian economies. Uh, my question for you then is what role does remote sensing data play in disaster impact assessment? And also what kinds of complementary data may be required to make it effective and suitable for economic analysis? Over to you, Ilan. Yeah, thank you, um, Adabi, and thank you, the audience, for um, for being here. Um, when we think on the of the economics of 
disasters, we're basically thinking about two stages in terms of now casting. We're thinking about trying to understand what is the immediate damage that is caused by a disaster. So disaster is some kind of hazard that hits an exposed and vulnerable population. And then it causes all these things, uh, uh, mortality, morbidity, displacement, and, and asset damage. Potentially, we can use remote sensing data of some sort or big data in general um, to, um, to identify the damage. We can also um, potentially identify the indirect losses. So the indirect losses are the ones that are caused because of the damage to, um, to people or, or place. Uh, the indirect loss is a flow measure of the decline in economic activity that happens because of a disaster. So, but in order to do both of these things, both the damage and the indirect loss, we cannot just use the, the big data sources that we sort of commonly think of, like, you know, uh, location data from, from mobile phones or payment data from, um, um, you know, ele electronic transactions. Um, or remote sensing data from, from outer space. We need to somehow match that with, um, with economic data that will then let us translate that information into some kind of an informed, well-informed economic metric. And we need those economic metrics in order to be able to uh, design a, um, disaster risk reduction and disaster risk management policies, both before disasters and once those events happen. So if, if I can, give you a few very, very brief examples. Um, this, this looks at um, vegetation index um, in a section of New Zealand, but we can do that for basically any other country. Um, and it looks at the change in the vegetation index over time. And we can do that for every few days because we have um, the data for it from um, satellite data. Um, and then we can identify exactly when there's a drought or when there is a flood, exactly what it would be the impact of the, um, the event on vegetation. Now, though, what we need is to match that with economic data so we can translate the damage to the vegetation into some kind of a metric on how much did farmers lose because of this in terms of their crop losses. Uh, what is the meaning of that for their um, you know, household income? Uh, and so forth. So we always need to match that remote sensing data with some kind of economic data. Um, another example, this is fishing activity globally um, using uh, GPS um, trackers that, that um, bigger ships um, are mandated to have. They don't always have, and, and sometimes they turn them off when they're doing things that are illegal. Uh, but um, this is the available data at this point in time. Uh, we're looking at other sources of data that we look be able to overcome that, those um, issues. Uh, but then we can track again, we can, for example, track cyclones, uh, tropical cyclones and see the impact on those, um, uh, on those fishing activities globally. And we can potentially, um, if we have the data on, for example, households, um, fishing households uh, incomes, we can then match that with, with what that means in terms of their loss of um, income. Um, maybe one last example, because we are in pandemic times. This is the uh, nightlights in the city of Wuhan. Um, that was, if you all remember, very, very, very long time ago uh, when the pandemic started. Um, that, you know, we could track then um, on a daily basis the recovery of the city once it, oh, it started to open up after the very uh, strict lockdown that they had in February. They started opening up, and you can see clearly in those two images how the city is opening up for uh, business again after the um, the lockdown, and how efficient it is. And we can actually show that by by mid March they were back to uh, pre pandemic times in in terms of the nightlights. Uh, now, do we is that does that mean that they were back to uh, uh, pre pandemic times in terms of economic activity? Again, we need to match that with some kind of um, uh, on the ground economic metrics that are provided less frequency and less spatial detail just to very, to understand what exactly is going on. But it always, the conjunction is the big data with some kind of a, a on the ground economic metric, potentially at lower frequency and lower um, spatial detail that can, can then give us the uh, economic information. I will stop there. <laughs>
Thank you, Alan. I think you raised some very interesting issues there that big data, including remote sensing data, is extremely useful because it's timely and available immediately after an event. But it's also useful for measuring short term and long term um, losses or impacts, especially when combined with more traditional data sources. And this is something we should think about as we uh, continue in our research. Uh, let me invite Sonia to talk a little bit. Um, Sonia, in your research um, in development issues spanning agriculture, gender, and socioeconomic disadvantage, I'm sure you have come across that a lot of um, required data is missing or not available, both in traditional and big data. Uh, let's take the example of gender. What would an ideal data set look like for a researcher like you? And do you see some more recent tools such as rapid digital surveys useful for overcoming the information gap? Over to you, Sonia. Thank you, Madhavi, for that question. Uh, so yeah, I was really um, intrigued by Elon's presentation about this remotely sensed data and how you actually need a socioeconomic data on the ground where you can match this data. And the same applies to uh, you know, cyclone or other natural disasters. So you can actually monitor the impact or the uh, atrocity of the cyclones or atrocity of the natural disaster, but you need some kind of uh, on the ground socioeconomic data, which you can map this data to, to understand how it affects life on earth. And one of the major challenges and difficulties I experience when I work with this data is that these data are not gender disaggregated. So speaking of ideal data, uh, we would expect the data to be disaggregated as much as possible in very many different dimensions, including sex, age, race. But at the very least, I think we, uh, what we desire is that the data would give us some sex disaggregated information. And uh, so even uh, with the start of the pandemic, uh, the World Bank launched some uh, high frequency data collection initiatives where they do like bi-monthly phone surveys. And these are rapid phone surveys. When, and so these surveys are very useful to understand the overall household level impact of the pandemic on some very broad generic social, uh, welfare outcomes such as food security, income, unemployment. But if we want to understand or explore how even within the household, men and women were differently affected, then it's very hard to capture this information from this household level data set. Uh, so one of the reasons why these data are not sex disaggregated is partly because there is time constraint, there is resource constraint, and these data are by design rapid. So collecting more sector segregated information would require more time and resource, uh, but also partly because of uh, the lack of understanding that men and women are different. So disaster affects men and women differently. And also men and women have different coping capacity, different level of access to resources and access to other adaptive capacity. Uh, so some, and a, a lot of even like government uh, surveys, they are the data or the survey instruments are gender blind because they don't understand that disaster affects people differently. So to give you an example, uh, what would be a gender specific welfare outcome is that, um, um, you know, women have uh, sort of different needs for healthcare. For example, access to reproductive health, access to maternal health, and even access to contraception. So these are very gender specific needs. And the very generic household surveys don't help us understand whether in the aftermath of a natural disaster, those very gender specific needs are met. Uh, other types of gender specific impacts of natural disaster are uh, gender-based violence. So even in the wake of COVID pandemic, we have uh, read newspaper reports from all over the world that domestic violence has increased um, in an unprecedented level, uh, partly because people lost income, uh, there was unemployment, uh, in excessive use of alcohol and drugs, 
And also partly because of the isolation and all the other, like the regular support system that used to prevent women from uh, violence where didn't, didn't exist due, due to the pandemic. Uh, so as a result of all this, we observed that there was a lot of uh, news media report that reported a surge of violence against women. But these household surveys, the high frequency household surveys did not help us capture that uh, the, the extent and the nature of the violence against women. And also when it comes to this very generic uh, or broad welfare indicators like food insecurity and even um, income and, and unemployment and healthcare and uh, education ex expenditure, even when it comes to these kind of welfare outcomes, research has shown that the, within the household, these resources can be differently allocated between men and women. Although at the household level, we may not see that a household is food secure, but an individual within the same household may be food insecure, even though the household is not. So that's because when household experience a shock and they adjust their consumption and expenditure is usually done at the margin of women's and girls' welfare. So girl, uh, women and girls' food consumption decreases or they consume less nutritious food or less diverse food, their health expenditure goes down and their education expenditures are cut back to cope with the uh, income shock. Uh, so all these nuances cannot be captured uh, or even then the outreach of the social protection mechanisms. Uh, those are also at the household level. So we see that whether household has received social uh, protection uh, or all the cash transfer or in-kind transfers, but we again don't understand from these household surveys how much of this social protection, cash transfer supports were actually benefited women or received by women. So I'll stop there and I can come back uh, and, and contribute again later if you have more questions. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, you're absolutely right. I think that if big data is to be seen as an effective complement to existing data, it should contain certain features that may not exist in current data sources. So if I were to make a list on what would make big data transformative, I think gender disaggregation would really top that list. And uh, yeah, we should come back and talk more about it. Um, but let me invite Eleni to talk a little bit about another very exciting data source. Eleni, text data is something that has become quite popular these days. Text is abundant and everywhere in blogs, news articles, speeches, reviews, uh, webinars, etc. What are some of the features that make text a useful data source for economic monitoring and impact assessment? Perhaps you can give us some examples of how text data has been used in developed countries. To you, Eleni. Yeah. Thank you, Madhavi. Thank you for your question. Indeed, text is everywhere, as you just mentioned. And as you said, uh, text is an alternative data source and comes with many benefits. And it is actually only recently that this uh, data source has become a big trend in economics field. Just to give you a bit of a background, um, Professor Robert Schiller was one of the first ones in 2017 who formally, you know, introduced narrative economics and kind of analyzed their dynamics on, you know, driving economic events. And we particularly see, we particularly see an explosion of studies um, in academia and policy, you know, that uses sort of text sources to analyze economic activity. You know, you know, might have a, uh, come across, you know, this economic policy as entity text-based indices that people have been using in order to track uncertainty or the, you know, uh, world sentiment indexes that are produced by the IMF on a regular basis now. And I think um, one of the main reasons of this proliferation of studies out there now is that text can offer timeliness, as also the previous uh, discussions have mentioned about other sources of data. So um, take as an example newspapers, right? Um, articles are published on a daily basis and you know, possibly have the potential to provide some economic signals um, compared to other so soft information with, uh, in, a timely, in a more timely manner. Um, compared to other soft information which suffers from the usual publication lags, like the survey data that people have been traditionally using before. 
So it also be, with text, it also becomes uh, possible to quickly narrow down perhaps issues of priority in a real time monitoring framework. Um, you know, as people tend to allocate more text to issues that are important to them, right? Um, all, you know, moreover, also, you know, text cannot be useful in country concepts that may not be measured well by traditional indicators um, and data collection methods like the business confidence indices um, or, you know, PMI data that, uh, in, especially in the policy, um, people have been um, using uh, use them uh, a lot in, in the last couple of uh, decades now. So I think that this real-time nature of text data makes it valuable for con continuous monitoring uh, the economic conditions, but also assess the impact on major economic events. Um, so in more advanced countries, people have been using news media, which essentially produce real-time descriptions and assessments of the economy at, a, at a high frequency and constructed essentially components of, um, of the economic outlook uh, like sentiment or sentiment or uncertainty, where we know that exists in the economic environment, and we know that actually can play a huge role, uh, but we cannot really quantify them. So, um, also these tools have been useful in the in the adva in advanced economies to uh, you know uh, uh, to track uh, extreme economic shocks like the recent coronavirus outbreak that we had recently, right? Because, for example, with policies such as the lockdown, where it's literally, as you see, as, as though uh, you know, whole sectors of the economy to be to be turned off overnight. Um, all these major economies and financial institutions use these new source, sources uh, to build early warning mechanism and you know track real economic activity as closely as possible. Um, of course, you know, we also need to mention here that these data do not have the same quality as, say, series of pleading economic indicators. However, you know, the fact that uh, they, they have such a rich granularity means that maybe we can perhaps use them in different ways. Um, and also, uh, you know, to conclude, I would argue, uh, as previously uh, discussed, that, you know, uh, the information impending in, in text, but also in other big data sources, can be a powerful complement uh, to more traditionally structured data that um, have been used in research but also in policy. Um, and in many advanced countries, uh, there is this proliferation of economic empirical research utilizing um, text as data. And I think also the idea is quite catching, uh, you know, in development countries and including Asia, because uh, given the low frequency of some of the major standard indications that you have there, and I think this is where these sort of real time and high frequency alternative sources can, can add real value. Um, yes, I think I will stop here and I'm, I'm pretty happy to answer on any other questions um, later on. Thank you, Eleni. No, that's very helpful because I think you have um, pointed a very important feature of big data, which is to build early warning mechanisms. It may not be a panacea for all issues and all uh, economic challenges or development problems, but it certainly has a lot of potential in certain contexts. Um, let's take some questions uh, from the audience. Okay, uh, there is a question here that says, how costly is it for developing countries to establish a surveillance program for each data source, as this goes to the issue of sustainability? And relatedly, should the algorithms developed be proprietary? Uh, why don't I direct this to Norayan? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, of course, Part of the challenge is really agreeing um, around what are the data sources that you need um, versus those that are value adds, and what are the ways that you can use these different combinations of data sets together to get to different levels of resolution and different types of, of, of answers and outcomes. And so before really going out to obtain big panels of data, I think it's really about setting up what are the frameworks that you use in a decision-making process and what decisions can you make with different data sets and how do combining them you know, across the panel uh, start to help you make um, certain kinds of decisions or generate certain types of, of output. So I think that's really the first piece. The next piece is how expensive are some of these data sets? And at a nation scale, sometimes they're very expensive. Um, if you're looking at you know, working with telcos, 
for GSM data for triangulation. This could be very cost prohibitive because baked into that is a lot of privacy concerns. And of course, then of course you have to store all of this data. So there can be some large costs there. And then also around this concept of resolution and accuracy, right? So if you're getting real time live satellite data feeds all the time, that can be you know, quite expensive. Um, and so it really comes down to what's the level of resolution that you need? What is the frequency of the update of the data that you're, you're, you're trying to collect? And how can you use that for maximum benefit? So I think there's a few fundamental questions to get right before going out and obtaining these large data sets. And then of course, if you do, um, there are many wonderful open source platforms for you know, bridging the gap in the data science space. Um, and then there are also this sort of taking, there, there are many companies in the world taking base data and then translating that into synthesized layers that you can already use in normal, you know, geospatial and analytics tools. And so there's, there's just a question set there. Do you want to own the whole process in the pipeline or are there already more synthesized data sets that you can get your hands on to make that process easier? Thanks, Narayan. Um, following up on that data science point, there is a question that says, can data science be the bridge to settle this accord between people dealing with macro scale issues, especially in economics and public policy? Um, Ilan, would you like to take that? Um, sure. Um, but first, I want to say something about the cost, the, the previous question. Um, you know, in my view, the, the the main cost is not the cost of the data itself. Um, all of the data that I presented is publicly available for free. Um, and a lot of other data is, is publicly available for free. And where it's not, I think it's incumbents of, on governments to make that data available. Um, so, you know, Narayan uh, suggested the, the, the data from the third. Um, government can force the telcos to provide that data. Um, so that data is, yes, the, the telcos are using that data as a, another source of revenue, but I think governments can, can impose their will in this case because all the telcos are essentially licensed um, providers of services. Um, and so, so, the, so the cost <clears throat> is not so much in the purchasing the data, it's in um, using that data in meaningful ways and, and processing it. And that's where governments uh, need to develop, I think, in-house capacities, or if they're paying for capacity elsewhere, they need to make sure that this is done open source um, and, 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 and then is then available um, for, um, for others to use, of course, subject to privacy concerns and things like that. Um, as, as to whether big data can resolve the big fundamental questions, the meaning of life, no. Uh, big data is not going to answer that. The answer is not 42. And um, I don't think that that's, that's what we're looking for, uh, for big data. I think to a lot of very specific questions about, you know, if we take the disaster issue, the disaster issues, um, you know, exactly which sectors are being harmed by disasters at what scale of temporal scale, spatial scale, and so forth. A lot of those questions can be answered by big data, yes. Um, the big questions, um, not so much. Uh, for that, I think we need philosophers, not big data. Thanks. Um, thanks, Ilan, and thanks, Narayan. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the ecosystem around big data, because turning massive amounts of data into usable information not just requires data, but also, you know, as you've talked about accessibility, but also computation power, capacity for storage, processing, data science skills, so new kinds of um, uh, human capital. How can Asian economies strengthen both their intent and capacity to build this infrastructure? Um, let me invite Sonia to start off. Hi, Madhavi. I can only support the claim that it is kind of problematic. I don't actually know much about the solution. So let me explain my experience of working with this uh, big data or from different kind of uh, sources. So in my research, I use data from different sources. So I use remotely sensed data as well as 
GIS data as well as household data. Because I'm a microeconomist, I work, my interest is household level outcomes. And I com complement household data with data from different sources to understand the, how disaster impacts household welfare. So currently I've worked on Australia as well as in India, Bangladesh. So when I was trying to combine this uh, remotely sensed data in, in, and trying to combine this with other kind of household level outcomes in Australia, I found that extremely easy to do this because the special units in Australia are very meticulously geocoded and all these information are openly available. So you can, within a minute, download all this information in your laptop and then they have very good identifiers, very clear identifiers, even in some cases where these geocodes have been updated, but they, there is a link or a reference available how you can use this or connect this new geocodes to previous geocodes. So all very easy and transparent and very easy to navigate. Now I'm currently working with uh, on a household data set from India. And I'm trying to merge this household level data set with various different types of open resource data set and uh, high frequency data sets. So the challenge there is this is the geocode. So the infrastructure is very weak at the moment in, in India and Bangladesh. So they have census codes for different for specific villages, but these census codes don't match to the shape file census codes because they are outdated. And for also there is no like uh, national or official shape files available in India for all the 34 states or 29 states that they have. So then you have to like look for these shape files one, one by one and these different shape files are not standardized. And then when you try to match these shape files with household data, they're not compatible. So what we are currently doing is we are matching these household data and shape files using village names, which is not the ideal way to do it. So there's a lot of manual uh, adjustments and also manual kind of um, uh, editing that you have to do to make sure that these are correct village names because names can be different depending on their spelling, how they're spelled and also multiple village names can be existing in different districts. So that costs a lot of money because I have to hire someone who can go through these names and then make sure that these names are aligned. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's one problem. Uh, then I also experienced another uh, type of problem where the, there is household data, but because of privacy concern, these, the geocodes are not made available, are not. So there's publicly available data set, but this publicly available data set don't disclose the location of those households. So that's a, from a, another extreme that you we have household information, but we don't have the special location of the household. So we can't do a very rich analysis of the household welfare and other dimension of household impacts because of the lack of availability of the geocode. So I even tried reaching out to this survey or organizations that collected this data, but they won't share the special location of this household due to privacy concern. So these are all the challenges that I experienced. And I, and it's, it's very clear that the infrastructure is, is very different and these developing countries and developed countries are at very different stages. Uh, but I don't have any solution for this. Well, I think it is safe to say that research in this field is still at a nascent stage. Uh, a lot of it is developing. In fact, there is a question here that says that um, big data has not attained the stature of official statistics that go through a rigorous process of methodological development, even to fault before their adoption by countries. So uh, Romulo here has a question if there is already, you know, are there forums out there or scientific journals that regularly convene or, you know, um, publish to discuss or resolve on methodological issues on the use of big data? 
Uh, well, I don't know about that, but I think some big data uh, research is being published now in um, peer reviewed journals. Uh, Eleni, would you like to come in on that? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Madhavi. Yes, uh, I, I agree with you. I think the last couple of years we have seen traditional econometric uh, and economic journals that have started publishing um, and including information uh, on their publications about uh, alternative data sources and how this can be used. And they offer there some first of first insights about um, you know, uh, how this can be uh, used in the more traditional econ economic uh, um, manner. So uh, I'm pretty sure there is um, there is all, already some steps forward to, to that direction. Uh, but I'm not I, I, I can still see that there's a lot of space in research um, to uh, for the use of these new sources. Uh, and I can also uh, maybe share also my experience, my experience using these tech sources and how you know, we have to deal uh, when it comes to um, micro um, economic publications and how we can essentially can turn uh, something which is inherently qualitative uh, to something with, that is uh, quantitative, uh, to give this quantity, quantitative shape, but also uh, to give some uh, economic um, economic uh, sense there. So, um, because I, I can also, you know, I think my experience serves as an example um, that goes to the exact opposite direction as, uh, compared to what previously discussed in a sense that um, most of the times when it comes to tech sources and, and I don't know, newspaper articles, you either have two options there, either to buy the data, so there's no one will give you this for free because they're owned by uh, public, uh, by, by private companies, or to do some sort of web scraping, which requires a lot of technical skills and sometimes so a bit of a grain, so like you don't really know what are the legal, legal um, issues behind this. So in our case, for example, when we had to deal with um, creating sentiment indices about Asian economies, we had to buy our data from a prime or pri uh, private owned company. And um, uh, which was, what was one of the first challenges that I guess that you can, you ha you can deal with. Uh, but also in order to you know, create meaningful indica indicators out of the sources, you need to have technical skills, you need to have, um, as previously mentioned, computer power. Um, so we need expertise. And you know, um, as economists, these are skills that traditionally maybe they were not existing in our field. So, uh, and this is where maybe we need to have some sort of collaboration with, with other disciplines there to, um, you know, to help us um, introduce these new metrics and these new technologies um, in the economic research. Ilan, would you like to come in with your experiences here? To me, and here I agree completely with Eleni, the main obstacle is not necessarily data costs or even data processing uh, power, because a lot of there's a lot of platforms now, cloud platforms. So Google, for example, makes the Google Earth Engine uh, platform, which is a very powerful platform, um, freely available. Uh, the main challenge is, is the, the, the workforce that can do this. Um, this meaning use of this big data into convert them into meaningful um, metrics. Um, there needs to be a lot of more education on this, um, there, but there is a global shortage of data scientists um, so this is not unique to developing countries. This is not unique to developing Asia. Um, that's also true for any country. Um, the main bottleneck is not the data and not the processing power. It's the, the human capital. Um, and you know, the, the, there's only one way to improve that. And fortunately, I work in a sector that is um, doing that improvement, and that's the education. I'm uh, losing you, Ilan, there. Uh, but I think you make a good point there that there is a shortage of this particular skill and um, and Norayan will probably tell us that data science is now one of the coolest jobs going. Uh, Norayan, let me ask you this question. Uh, mobile phone and credit card companies, social media sites like Facebook, um, all these have big data that could be a source of rich economic insights. What kinds of partnerships could the um, policymakers pursue so that there is, um, you know, some kind of relationship between the public and the private enterprises to make big data initiatives successful? Yeah, I mean, of course, the the private 
companies like Facebook and, and others use their big data to build new tools in a way that they can have a, you know, a direct market approach to their, to growing their business. And so Facebook labs, the level of funding that they have to obtain the most qualified staff and data scientists to build tools and protocols. I mean, and we're talking about companies like Visa and Google and Facebook, you know, they, they, they're, have unlimited reach in terms of, you know, obtaining talent. So they have, of course, this phenomenal ability of building amazing tools and systems for their own means, but then flowing out of that is a lot of open source data that they do publish as well. So there are many very large data sets at nation scales, like, you know, um, Bing buildings, which are often available as geopolygons for an entire country, or you know, hyper resolution um, population data that's that's uh, linked to mobility is also freely available from Facebook, um, etc. Et so I think part of it is just knowing where it is to look and what partnerships that some of these companies have already put in place um, with, with with large entities like. The UN and others. So there is there are a lot of um, freely available large data sets that are flowing out of um, these companies. They're always a step ahead too. So I think part of it is like I mean we talked about the whole the use of you know qualitative research and looking at how we can bring in community voice data to do you know deep analysis on sentiment. They're the masters of that too, and we don't know exactly what is going on in the you know the back the back rooms in terms of what is actually being recorded or not um, but there are increasingly uh, more data sets becoming available and of course you know as Alon said that's how do we on the other side of the fence get our hands on those and use those to make turn data into insights and and I would say whilst the the human capital is in, in data. Data science is 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 a, you know a pretty tight market at the moment. The other piece is around what is it should we consistently measure? And there are many frameworks afoot, from you know the UN SDGs to individual nation frameworks. Then cities have their own, and so on and so forth. So I think there's also a bit of a metrics war. Um, around you know what it is that we should measure and 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 against which metrics do we compare and set indices and baselines well i think another issue that often comes up when we talk about big data is privacy you know cyber security concerns and so on um, are there regulations coming into place to address these issues and if not, what should governments be looking at uh, in order to make effective use of this data while overcoming these concerns? Uh, who would like to take this question, um, Sonia? I actually don't have much information or understanding. As I mentioned, my problem with privacy is actually opposite because I figured that I realized that some of the survey companies or agencies, they're not sharing the location and I find that problematic. Uh, I also wanted to just add to Norian's uh, uh, discussion of Facebook data. I just wanted to share that I use Facebook data and I found them very um, uh, responsive. So I reached out to them and they shared the link of their, so they, there's some data that are publicly available, but some data they make available on request. So I reached out to them and then they make all the data that they have publicly uh, or, or I would say semi-public, uh, they share the link and I also access the data and I find some data very easily accessible and you can just download all these Excel spreadsheets and this data is also quite rich because they collect data, particularly for example, movement data. They collect it four times a day, every day of a month. So it's like really, really rich data set. Uh, but my, my challenge is that they are not gender specific, gender disaggregated. So the only gender disaggregated data they have is uh, population displacement. Uh, so, but these data, the, when I access this Facebook data, I found that these data are more 
make available at the geographical unit. Uh, so for example, you will, they create like a tile uh, of I think 600 meter by 600 meter geographical uh, space. So these, there is no concern about privacy uh, when you are looking at like a, or data is coming in the form of a geographical unit in, 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 in a, instead of like a individual. Um, but, you know, there are several privacy breaches from Google, from Facebook. So I do understand that there are concerns about privacy and how these companies are collecting this data, whether the users are aware that these data are being collected and used to, is being shared publicly, although they are not like individualized data. Uh, uh, so I really don't have much understanding of privacy issues surrounding this data gathering. I would love more data um, and more like uh, high frequency data and more sex desegregated, more age desegregated so that I can do research and can produce information that are highly policy relevant and can design very targeted, highly effective policy. But I also am aware that this might get into, uh, these companies might get into trouble with uh, privacy concern. And I just don't know how to kind of reconcile these two issues. At this, at, on the one hand, we need more disaggregated information. But on the other hand, we also need to make sure that there's no privacy breach. So I think, yeah, Norion has his hands up. He probably would be able to help us. Oh, I won't take much, much more time on that one, but I, I would just say that the, um, you know, Worldwide, there are increasingly um, more regulations coming in into this space, right? So, um, several years ago, the big push with GDPR and, of course, um, rules in California and in other countries around the world that look to adopt global best practice privacy, um, which has then, of course, caused some of you know the larger companies that generate and sell. Um, personal identifiable information or even pseudonymized data that could potentially be re-identified. Re um, and in all of this work is, of course, the need to not look for individuals, right? I think we, we can all agree here that we're interested in patterns. We're interested in um, human impact. We're interested in the big problems, not in the movement of an individual or you know the sentiment of an individual. And so I think when we do work, we have to, of course, have our own policies in place of how we deal with potential um, personal identifiable information and what we do to safeguard that in a way that we can find the patterns that help us um, whilst protecting people's privacy um, and, and identities. And of course, there is always this need for, as you've said, disaggregation at a higher degree of detail. And, you know, in some cases, it, it comes down to you know a, a, you know a human on the ground survey right and and having a conversation with the community or having conversations with people where big data can get used to one one point and then it then we also need to you know follow through in the in a, in a traditional way as well indeed and um I think apart from these issues, uh, the three R's always come up, relevance, reliability, and representativeness of data. And this is very important in economic analysis and research. Um, in fact, there is a question here that says, there's also the aspect of false data. And I think um, Jeanette is referring to text data, but this may be true for uh, all kinds of big data. Um, Eleni, would you like to come in maybe from the perspective of text and maybe Ilan can talk a little bit about about uh, what he thinks of uh, biases and representativeness and other issues in big data. Eleni? Okay, thank you, Madhavi. Yes, uh, so in my experience with, with text data, what we have seen so far is that text is, is, in a, is, is quite unstructured and it's high dimensional, which means that it's quite noisy. So there you need to really uh, come up with a way so you can make sure that you extract only the information that you are interested in. Um, and this, as you said, you need to be very careful there of uh, not introducing any bias on your data and uh, really making very um, 
uh, a lot of a, a lot of uh, checks there in order to be able to to make sure that the data sources and the text that you uh, include in your analysis is relevant to your research. Um, so I think uh, text is a serves as a really good example where we can see that there these sort of forces happen very uh, regu very regularly, and you need to be aware of this. Uh, for example, when somebody uses text, the first thing that it's the people have been doing when they do this text analysis is to pre-process the text, so clean the text, which means you know to discard any uh, punctuation marks or any any characters, any words that they don't really necessarily uh, add up to, um, to add any value there. Um, so I think uh, you know there is re or ongoing research on data setting or how you can proper process this data. Um, but of course, uh, I guess it also again boils down to the fact that uh, because text analysis is something that comes has its oranges in computer science. So we need to um, adopt tools from other disciplines in order to be able to uh, convert text into um, a meaningful economic tool. Um, and that and also just commenting on the previous question uh, about um, about the privacy issues. In my experience so far, when I have been, when we have been using these uh, newspaper articles where we had data from Factiva, which is a private uh, company, uh, privacy issues can rise also when it comes to uh, publish to academic publications. On the more academic side, uh, these more, some of these companies may have restrictions on about publishing the data, the, the data after. Uh, for uh, uh, for research or about the derived even the derived metrics that you can get out from this so maybe these sort of privacy issues can come up um, and people need to be aware of this depending on what is the use of the data they want to make Milan, would you like to add something here well on, on the privacy issue i think i do want to distinguish between what eleni was talking about that's proprietary data and privacy issues Privacy issues are um, very, very important, and um, we need to acknowledge them and we need to be very, very careful about them. I do think that in some cases we see that the sort of the pendulum is swinging um, sometimes too far to the side, side of privacy, and um, companies and governments, especially, are very reluctant, becoming more and more reluctant to share data. Um, because of these privacy concerns, and some of sometimes those privacy concerns can be overcome through some kind of an anonymization process, or through um, you know um, agreements with researchers. Um, sometimes, for example, forcing the researcher to work in a specific data lab that has no sort of outside access. And so there are ways to get, get around around those privacy concerns, but you sometimes see organizations and governments being so worried about this that they are not willing to, to try and find a solution. That's the comment about um, um, privacy. So I, th I think we can overcome these issues as, because as Norian said, none of us is, is an, you know, really cares about John specifically and where John is going and what's he doing. Um, but what we, we want, we care about people more, gen more generally. I think there was another question, but I'm not, I don't remember what it was. Well, I think you have hit on several of these issues. And anyway, we are at the head of the hour, so we should wrap up now. Uh, but this in discussion has been very interesting and the comments in the question answer box also allude to the fact that while developing countries are very much part of the big data revolution, uh, there are a lot of questions uh, today, but that doesn't mean that we don't have an exciting future ahead. So it's not really a question of if or when, but really about how big data can start to provide insights that would be useful for development and resilience. So with that, I would like to wrap up today's session and give a big thank you to all our panelists for their excellent and exciting insights on what the future holds for us. Thanks also to all our participants for uh, their interesting questions and comments. If you enjoyed today's event, please tune in to our next webinar titled Two Years On, COVID-19 Impacts on Gender Equality in Asia on 29th March, 2022, 11 a.m. Manila time via Zoom. Thank you all once again. Stay well.